I'm the director of the SOAS China Institute. I'm delighted that we have a fantastic speaker to talk on a subject that is very important to the United Kingdom. And the subject is, is the UK's China po policy fit for purpose? And the speaker is Mr. Charles Parton. Um, Charlie is a senior associate fellow at RUSI, the Royal United Services Institute in London. He's also an associate fellow of the Council on Geostrategy. And he also served as a specialist advisor on China to the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee for its 2018-19 China inquiries. Mr. Parton has a long distinguished career in the diplomatic service of the United Kingdom and the EU separately. Um, when he was working for the EU and the UK diplomatic service, he focused mostly on China, Hong Kong and Taiwan, even though he also, as you would expect, cover other regions. He has published extensively in academic journals and many UK newspapers and, and speaks frequently on the main media, whether we're talking about the BBC, LBC, France 24, or Al Jazeera, and many others. And with his experience with UK's China policy and being somebody who always think for himself and speak his mind, I think he is genuinely a particularly well-placed uh, speaker to address us on this very important subject. And before I hand it over to uh, Mr. Parton, let me just remind you that this webinar will be recorded or indeed is being recorded now. When, at the end of the presentation, if you would like to raise a question or make a comment, please use the Q&A box at the bottom uh, right-hand corner. You are welcome to uh, stay anonymous, but it would be very helpful to me as moderator if you would put in the Q&A box information about yourself. That's just to help me to pick the questions to put to the speaker. But if you also say there, you would like to stay anon anonymous, your wish will be respected and no reference will be made, made about your institution or you. Now with that, let me hand over to Charlie. Steve, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm honoured to be given this opportunity to speak at a SOAS seminar. Um, actually, one thing you missed out of your introduction of me is that I learnt my Chinese at SOAS. Uh, that's where the Foreign Office sent me for my first year's language training, so I'm always grateful to the institution. Um, when we first discussed this uh, talk in the title, I thought to myself, well, this is going to be a very short talk because um, it's not clear to me or hasn't been for some time as to whether the UK actually has a policy on China uh, and therefore whether it's fit for purpose uh, would take hardly anything to talk about. Um, that's a little unfair, actually. Um, and I think that, uh, of course, we did have a, a, a China policy. That was the golden era which of, of George Osborne, which I spell with three R's. Um, but I think since then, um, it's clear that, that things have moved on very much. And uh, the Foreign Affairs Committee, you may remember, back in, in April 2019, specifically called on the need for a China strategy or China policy. Um, sometimes the reaction to that in government, as one official said to me, is, well, what's the point in having a strategy if it changes the moment that it's, that it's set? And of course, my answer to that is, that's the whole point. You have to keep changing as, as events keep changing and you have to keep updating it. Um, the Foreign Office itself used to have a China strategy. It's 2009. Do take a look at it. It's um, uh, as a list of aspirations of what we would like. It's, I think it remains fine but it's not really a guide as to the sort of actions that we need to take, particularly 12 years later. And recently, some of you will have read the integrated review, um, but that doesn't 
mean it's a, it certainly is not giving us a China strategy. If anything, the phrase that sort of leap, leaps out or the idea that leaps out is of a constructive ambiguity. And I don't think that really works. Uh, there's a contradiction there between um, you know, being ambiguous and if you say that you wish to be a global leader, well, how can you lead if no one exactly knows the direction in which you're leading? So um, I think we do need a strategy. I think the government is working hard on it. Uh, the question I would or I'm trying to answer in, in here is in the absence of a full oversight, which of course I have no oversight at all of what goes on in the government anymore, um, to what degree might it be um, going in the right direction and is it going in the right direction uh, at, with sufficient speed? I'd like to make some preliminary points if I may. Um, I mean, the first, and I say this in every talk that I give on, on, on China, is that whenever I use the word China, I'm really used, meaning the Chinese Communist Party. And I think the two are very different. But in terms of foreign policy, and that's what we're talking about here, um, don't ever forget that, um, as Xi Jinping has said, uh, the, the party controls everything, but the foreign affairs, the highest body involved in foreign affairs, is the Foreign Affairs Commission, and that is a party body. It's not a government body. Um, other points I would make uh, uh, that foreign policy is always domestic policy carried out abroad. I think that's possibly true of every country, but as so often with the Chinese Communist Party, I'd say it's even more so the case. And in that means that we need to look always in any foreign policy that, that the CCP um, is pushing, but what lies behind it in terms of its reflections in the domestic scene. Uh, and another thought that um, I don't fully agree with the recent paper by Chatham House, which tells us that Chinese foreign policy is very much more um, diversified than we think. To some extent, I think that's true, but um, because the party controls everything, because whatever aspect you are of Chinese foreign policy or involved in it, whether you're business, academia, cultural or political aspects of it, you must confirm, conform to, to Xi Jinping thought on, on, on diplomacy, uh, which is another uh, very distinct aspect of Xi Jinping thought, which Wang Yi, the foreign minister, has put a lot of effort into. Um, in, in, in that sense, foreign Chinese foreign policy is much more unified. Um, of course, in practice, the, the CCP is not always able, as it isn't domestically, to ensure implementation of all its wishes. Um, but it, that nevertheless is, is the purpose. Um, I'd like that now to sort of, uh, before I deal specifically with, with, with UK policy and its, its fitness for purpose, just to talk a little bit about the nature of Chinese foreign policy, because I think this is essential um, background to, to our thinking on this. Um, I'll also look a little bit very briefly at, at what the Chinese Communist Party wants from the UK. Uh, and then I'll look at um, the, the need, I think, for HMG or the government to understand better uh, the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and, and its diplomacy. And finally, end up by looking at some very specific measures which I which are going on, I think, in our, our, our building in progress, but as I say, may need to go deeper and faster than they are at the moment. So um, the nature of Chinese Communist Party foreign policy. I mean, outwardly, we, we, we hear all the business of win-win and a community of shared future of mankind, um, and, and it all sounds um, very um, uh, reassuring. If you look at what's said inwardly, the vocabulary changes very sharply and words such as struggle and hostile foreign forces are, are just about everywhere and I always think that people should look back at what what uh, the party itself or Xi Jinping says particularly at his first Politburo meeting back in January 2013 um, when he said that um, the Chinese socialism must gain the dominant position Yo shi over Western capitalism. This is a very strong statement, um, and it's one which reinforces struggle, which comes. And, and this wasn't just a one-off. I mean, again, uh, just a couple of weeks ago in the People's Daily, Xi Jinping is quoted as saying, um, and the translation is not particularly adequate, the competition between systems is an important aspect of competition, comprehensive national power, and the superiority 
of its system is a key advantage in a nation's effort to, to, to gain overall strategic initiative. This is pretty strong stuff. I mean, strategic initiative has a very strong military content to it, uh, amongst other things. So I don't think that we should be in any doubt that the Communist Party and Xi Jinping in particular sees foreign um, dealings in a very competitive, confrontational at times, uh, and sometimes hostile light. Which brings me on to the D word, um, which if you're a certain type of American might stand for decoupling, um, but if you're British might be divergence. And if you're Chinese Communist Party might also at times be coupling and certainly divergence. Um, I don't think we should be in any doubt that, that, that this is happening, that decoupling is happening, and it's being sped up by the erosion of the distinction in technology between um, civilian and military applications. But just look at the three sort of areas whether that's political system, value system, or economic system. And I don't think there's any doubt that we are moving further apart. Politically, of course, very much so. There's Xi Jinping has, if anything, uh, has definitely walked away from any form of political reform, even intra-party democracy. Uh, on the question of values, one only needs to point to what's happened in Hong Kong, in Xinjiang, the, use of high technology and control and surveillance sy uh, systems, the incipient totalitarianism that's going on in Chinese society. And I use that word totalitarianism deliberately. Uh, or indeed look at document number nine, again, year 2000, April, it was circulated amongst the party, which lists the uh, Jiang, the seven things you mustn't talk about. And they are the encapsulation of all the values that we here in the West stand for, and the party specifically rejects. So uh, political system, value system, definitely. And even the economic system, I think, with as, as the sort of reinforcement of the party's control over um, the economic levers, the, the, the reinforcement of uh, certainly the central SOEs, the, the, the levels of subsidies and the various other forms, um, the, the relationship between so-called private companies and, and, and the state. Uh, I, I think it's very difficult to argue that the economic systems aren't diverging. So we need to have that in mind, or our governments also have, need to have that in mind as they make their, their policy and strategy. If I were then to very quickly characterize the, the three main elements of Chinese foreign policy it would be, and this is crude, I, I, I know, um, it would be to say, well, first of all, the, the, the sticks and carrots, the economic sticks and carrots. Um, if you want to be positive, of course, you'd say it's more carrots than sticks, but the basic philosophy behind that is, if you align with us, the Communist Party, uh, and our interests and participate in, you, you get to participate in Chinese um, enormous size market, uh, there are investment opportunities. Uh, if you're in the third world, there's development aid, cheap loans, or, or, or whatever you get. The benefits of the BRI, which incidentally, the Belt and Road investment is a, is a very fine political slogan. I think it's less of, of an actual program, although I think we should pay attention to Chinese globalization. But that's another matter. Um, but if you go against us, then we will hit you. And, and we will put you in the diplomatic doghouse uh, and we will um, uh, harm your, your economic interests. And um, the list of countries that's gone into the diplomatic doghouse is, is lengthening, whether we, the UK, were in it as a result of the Dalai Lama. Uh, Mongolia, of course, offended on the Dalai Lama, Czech Republic did. Um, but also we've had Norway over Liu Xiaobo and, 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 and the um, Nobel Peace Prize. We've got Australia, Canada, um, uh, and, and South Korea over the missiles, etc. cetera. And the, if you go against what the CCP defines as its core interests, or your policies are perhaps too proximate to those of the United States, as, as may, might be said in the case of Australia, um, then uh, you, you will go into the diplomatic doghouse. So that's one area of, of Chinese foreign policy uh, methodology. I think the second I would label as, as the external propaganda work, 
massive resources go into this. Uh, I think The Economist in, in 2018 reckoned that in the decade up to then, China had spent 6.6 .6 billion US dollars on overseas propaganda. That figure must be well, well exceeded in, in, in the years since. If you look at the effort that's going into building up CGTN um, and, and Xinhua, for instance, abroad as, as um, rivals to, to things like the BBC or CNN, um, Reuters or the FT or, or The Economist, um, massive, massive um, amounts of effort going into that. We've seen large amounts of inserts into the Western press paying large sums of money. Daily Telegraph taking about £800,000 a year for, for 12 inserts until, until they stop that. Um, efforts to capture Chinese language press, local radio stations, and indeed to provide the sort of news coverage which increasingly Western agencies find difficult to finance. And in providing pictures and words and stories from wherever it is, you are, of course, angling those towards your view of the world and the way it should be. So external propaganda work, massive. That's why the uh, Xinhua set up, CGTN so called, set up a very big um, center here in, in London. And the third element I, I think we should concentrate on is the United Front, um, which Mao described as the third magic weapon along with the party and the People's Liber Liberation Army. Now, um, of course, the United Front is primarily a domestic beast. Uh, there are over 600,000 people working in the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference system, which is part of the, the United Front. But as China globalizes, it goes out into the world, of course, it must, um, the United Front goes, goes with it. Uh, I think that there's been a tendency here in, 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 in our countries in Europe to, uh, particularly in the press, to portray the United Front Work Department as, as, as the great bogeyman. Um, uh, but I think what is important perhaps um, to understand, I mean, it does operate in, 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 in our societies uh, and it does um, uh, do things which we would disapprove of in terms of interference. And I'm, very happy to go into that in some more detail in the question and answer. But um, rather than, I think we should, should concentrate on the United Front strategy because it's that strategy that's so important. And if I were to characterize it in a few sentences, the United Front strategy, whether it's the original um, version for use inside China against the KMT or, or one might say it's globalized version now is you identify the main enemy in foreign relations terms, that's, that's the US. And you seek to move uh, others, potentially potential, uh, potentially hostile entities, um, to a neutral state, and from a neutral to a friendly state. And those who are neutral, you try, uh, who are already neutral, you try to move to a friendly state, uh, in order to isolate the main the main enemy. And in the case of the UK, if you were to make a, a great generalization, you would say that the point of the U United Front strategy is to move us away from the main enemy, to isolate us from, from the United States. Um, and eventually, uh, the CCP might hope to make us more CCP friendly. Um, moving on then to the next uh, element, what exactly does the Chinese Communist Party want from the UK? Of course, I've just said it wants, it wants a, 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 in, in United Front strategy terms, um, a, a neutral, if not a friendly UK to its own aims. But um, in more specific terms, I think one looks at, at some of the positive things that the UK has to offer um, to China. We've got, um, they would like, I'm sure, for us to be a showcase for Chinese um, really central and important industries, whether that's telecommunications, Huawei, well, that game I think is, is over. Um, but in the nuclear industry or, or, or other uh, pillar industries of the Chinese uh, as it develops their sort of technological strength and, and, and business strength. So that's, that's Im Im important. We're a very open country. Uh, and if the UK takes on uh, some of China's, let's say, were it to take on some of Chinese nuclear technology, that would be an important message for, for markets elsewhere. 
the UK has got good innovation and good science and technology research. That's something that, that CCP would like to, to get involved with. Um, we're open to investment, um, far more so perhaps than, than many other countries. Um, this CCP would like to, to learn from the, the City of London and the services, the service sector, to develop its own expertise in, in finance and other areas. Um, and also, I guess, to support the greater use of the renminbi, the Chinese currency. Um, and you know, we're a supporter of a very open, global, non-protectionist economic global governance system. China has benefited very much from that. We're a P5 member. Um, and we've got other expertise in, in, in areas such as urbanization, health, social security, where the, where the Chinese feel that they may have, have lessons to learn. And we're still a big economy uh, and, and a reasonably sized market. So there are plenty of things where um, the CCP can see interest in working with us. On the negative side, one could say, well, if we were to deny any of those things above, that would be negative, and we've done so with Huawei. Um, but increasingly, we've got divergent positions on Hong Kong uh, and, and the imp implementation of the joint declaration there. Uh, on human rights, particularly in Xinjiang, uh, we support the United States in um, freedom of the seas in the South China Sea and, and, and upholding um, the, the law, the, the, the um, UNCLOS and laws there. We've got differences over media freedoms and, and governance. Uh, we've been pushing back against certain forms of interference by uh, CCP in the UK, in academia, politics and the media. Um, and we're getting increasingly strident about Chinese intelligence operations uh, and particularly cyber with, within our, our country. So there's elements of, of negativity there, which could um, be magnified in over coming years. So now to consider sort of UK strategy in given that background. Um, I mean, I think that the UK and indeed one could say any other European country has got a difficult balance to strike here because this is an increasingly globalized world. We want to work with China. We want to have good relations with China. Um, but at the same time, we have to prioritize our security, our values and, and, and our prosperity. And in some ways, in many ways, as I said earlier, those are diverging. So uh, in an ideal world, we would agree to disagree with China on, in many areas, but seek to maximize um, those areas which we have in common, because this isn't a Cold War, although, and I hesitate use, to use the word war, but certainly it's a divergence in values and systems, as I've said, uh, and we therefore need to be prepared and we have the right to prepare ourselves. And so, uh, when I move ahead now to look at what the UK is doing, the question I think when we go back to is, is our policy fit for purpose is to what degree have we prepared ourselves for the, the new China and for the divergence that, that there is in, in our values and our political systems and our security, etc. So let me just um, then look at um, the first of sort of two approaches. One is does the UK, does HMG, um, the UK government, properly understand um, the Chinese Communist Party and the nature of its diplomacy? Um, and has it got a proper perspective on the way that it operates? And I am um, not sure that it, that it does. Um, I think that uh, it, it, in terms of, um, and I've written a long paper about this, and please do go and read it. Uh, it's on the Council of Geostrategies website and it's called Empty Threats, uh, Making Policy Amidst Chinese Pressure. Um, and I think that there's a danger that many people in government and also outside government um, are getting the wrong perspective on this um, sticks and carrots uh, element of Chinese foreign policy, which I sketched out. And in that paper, I talk, I talk about six areas where you will hear people say, well, if we don't do what the Chinese Communist Party wants, then we're going to be in trouble in, and then the six areas follow. 
And the contention I have that actually, if you look at those six areas uh, in some detail, then the bark is very much cons um, considerably more, you know, considerably worse than the bite. So please read the paper, but very briefly, let me just look at those the, the six areas. The first is, is, is exports. Um, of course, people always refer to, to Chinese, UK Chinese trade um, and, and allied the fact that we have a massive deficit um, and that in one sense, if trade were to cease, China would lose far more than, 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 than we were. But um, my, my contention is that with exports, um, these tend to carry on regardless of the political storms that are carrying, that are, that are whirling around um, politicians' heads, providing that companies are producing the right sort of goods, the goods that China needs, can't produce for itself, uh, providing the price and the quality is right, then exports go on quite happily, no matter that you're in the doghouse. And in that paper, I looked at most of the major countries that have been in the doghouse, um, and there's some quite interesting graphs which show that throughout the years when those countries were in the doghouse, their exports with China grew. Uh, in fact, oddly enough, the only years that they tended not to grow was when they were in the Chinese good books, but that actually was due to uh, matters extraneous to, to the relationship with, with China uh, related to what was going on in the world economy, for instance. Um, so what happens if you get in the doghouse? Well, of course, um, there's a lot of pain inflicted because ministers get cut off and there's a lot of political hoo-ha. But when it comes to uh, exports, China will hit four types of goods. Those that are symbolic, Norwegian salmon, for instance. Um, those that aren't essential to China. Um, those that China can get elsewhere. Um, and those that are politically sensitive which in particular it, uh, tends to be agricultural goods because agricultural lobbies in various countries are quite strong. But the interesting thing about that is, uh, and again, look at the figures, if you are, um, uh, because China has a food security problem, a real problem, uh, agricultural goods tend to be hit only for about one year. It's disruptive, but then uh, take up again. And if you look at what happened with Canada, for instance, uh, and canola oil, uh, you can't now get canola oil in, in Canada's reserves have been absolutely drained because China is importing it. And this was way before the, the, the Kovrig and the, the hostages situation was sold. So um, there, there's also, we should never forget that displacement trade happens. Okay, so Australian barley gets slapped with, with uh, tariffs. And so what happens? They export it to Saudi Arabia. So Australia's total barley exports don't really suffer. Yes, wine does, because wine is, is, is in, in plentiful supply in, in, in the world. But other areas, I mean, this year, for instance, China, Australia's wool quota with uh, China grew. New Zealand, strangely, stayed the same. But um, anyway, that, so uh, my, my point is your export trade does not suffer except in cer certain specific companies and, and areas. But overall, trade continues. Second, you will hear a lot of people say, well, we better not offend China because otherwise um, we, won't, we won't get Chinese investment and, and that would be an absolute disaster. Well, hold on a second. Um, as of the current most recent figures, Chinese stock of Chinese investment in the UK equates to 0.02% of investment from abroad. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, Chinese uh, investment in the UK is not a matter of charity. It's done increasingly, um, certainly since Xi Jinping and the Communist Party tightened up in 2016, very much with, with um, China's own aims in mind, for instance, about getting hold of, 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 of technology, in particular about getting hold of technology. But if you look at it from the UK point of view, uh, or indeed from any country's point of view, really, there are four main reasons for um, why you would welcome investment into your country. And in the case of, case of China, they really hardly apply. Firstly, money is expensive. Is money expensive and you can't get hold of it? Therefore, you would want to get it. But it isn't. Money is extremely, the price of money at the moment is extremely cheap. Secondly, you might want investment because it provides you with very good technology that you don't have. Well, the flow is the other way, uh, uh, certainly at the present. Um, 
thirdly, you might want management expertise that, that you don't have. And that's why we benefited so much, for instance, from some of the Japanese car companies and their, their just-in-time uh, inventories and their, their methods of, of, of investment, but, but, of management. But the UK industry is not benefiting from, from Chinese management. Uh, on the contrary, it's probably the other way around. Um, and fourthly, jobs, the creation of jobs. Well, if you look to the period pre-COVID, in the three years pre-COVID, according to DIT, the number of jobs created in the UK over those three years was 9,400. Now, that's, that's not to, to, to sniff at them, but it isn't a vast number. It really isn't a vast number. Um, and in fact, in the third of those years, it was 1,900, so it was actually decreasing. And I challenge you to name me a greenfield site investment of an industry uh, on a scale of sort of Honda or Nissan or something that's uh, brought a large amount to, to, to the UK. So um, yes, we welcome Chinese investment if it's in the right areas and for the right reasons, um, but let's not kid ourselves that, 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 that um, we can't get on without it. The third reason is you will hear the city talking about, but there's mammoth growth to, to come in financial services exports. And we really must not offend China in, in that aspect because the city and services are so important to us. Yes, there is mammoth, mammoth growth to come because if you consider that currently the city's financial exports of its total global financial exports, 0.4% of it is connected with China, then from such a low base, growth can only be quite large. Um, and let's not actually forget that the city's financial exports uh, constitute only 10% of the UK's total financial exports. So the city's financial exports are, to China are 0.04%. Um, we have a stock connect between the London stock market and Shanghai, uh, a cause of great celebration when it's set up. Uh, to date, there are only two shares being traded on it. Uh, the renminbi internationalization is frequently trotted out as a reason for um, why we must, must be so nice to China. Um, at current, about 2% of the world's uh, transactions, international transactions are, are using the RMB, but the internationalization of the RMB is a long, long, long way ahead and won't happen until China opens the capital account. And I very much doubt that's going to happen in, in the next decade. So, um, and the, don't let's not forget that the city has very considerable attractions uh, and these will not diminish. And if China needs the city, which it does in some aspects, it will continue to use the city. So um, those, those advantages of, of the city will not go away. They're there to be, um, to be used, um, but they shouldn't be exaggerated, uh, the, the relationship with, uh, with China. Fourthly, well, our universities are thoroughly dependent upon Chinese students. And if we misbehave, um, the tap will be turned off and we'll be in terrible trouble. Well, first of all, um, I don't think Xi Jinping and the Communist Party in any way likes the fact that so many of its students go abroad to study abroad and get exposed to spiritual pollution. And the way things are going in terms of control of education in China and control of society. I'm sure that if he was able to, and maybe he will try, I don't know, Xi Jinping would love to turn off that tap, but it wouldn't be aimed at the UK. It would be aimed globally. Um, we, you know, we, the Communist Party, don't want so many of our students going abroad. Um, so that's not relevant to how our policy is configured with China. Now, would, would nevertheless the CCP use it as a specific um, weapon against UK universities, um, still allowing Chinese students to go abroad, but simply not to the UK. Well, it's possible, but I think that um, if you look at Chinese parents and their desires for their child and where, they, where that child might be educated, if they're going abroad, you want firstly a very good education, and the UK supplies that. And on the whole, you want education in an English speaking country because um, that's an extremely useful skill. And oddly enough, the main countries that fulfill those two conditions are the United States, the UK, Australia, Canada, and to a certain extent, New Zealand. So I think that threat is exaggerated. 
Uh, and of course, it makes, but it, make, it does make sense anyway for our universities to prepare themselves, or at least not to be too dependent upon any one supplier, just as any business will not, uh, if it's got any sense, rely, let's say, exclusively on Sainsbury's, because Sainsbury's might take the contract elsewhere, and then you're in trouble. Uh, and we shouldn't also forget that Chinese demographics are going to mean that the supply in the longer term is going to fade away. Next area we, we hear is, well, if we don't do what the Chinese Communist Party wants, our tourist industry, which is, gets gain, earns very considerable amounts, uh, will be hit. Well, of course, it's being hit by COVID at the moment, but let's assume that, that all things return to normal. The normality is that those countries which have been hit by Ch Chinese Communist Party over tourism have been those that received most tourists in the form of package tours. 88% of pre-COVID tourists to, to the UK were not on package tours. Uh, and the question is whether the Communist Party is going to be able to limit the wishes of ordinary Chinese who like to come to the UK. Um, it, it, tourism might be said to be the opiate of the, of the masses um, and depriving of the, of the opiate would be a very unpopular and possibly dangerous thing to do. So um, I'm not convinced that that is as big a threat. And the sixth threat that people talk about is, well, if we don't um, cooperate with China, they won't cooperate with us on climate change. And they're very capable of using um, that issue to gain leverage on others. I've always been very skeptical of this argument because by size uh, of effect and by numbers of people affected, no country in this world would suffer more by a rise in sea levels. You only have to look at the map of, of, of Shanghai and Zhejiang, um, Jiangsu area to see what would happen and what an appalling uh, catastrophe it would be for China as well as the rest of the world. Um, the CCP is well aware of that. Uh, I think that the CCP attitude to, to, to climate change is um, every bit as serious as, as ours. Uh, you might not necessarily think so as a result of, of what's happened at COP26, um, but like any set of politicians, I suggest that the CCP tends to put greater emphasis on the short-term threats, uh, prioritizes them over the long-term, even the threats, even though those threats are more serious. But I don't doubt personally that the, the um, Communist Party is very serious about climate change. And whatever we do about climate change, as, as the UK, whether it's in relation to China or not, uh, it's not going to consider us so much as its own interests. And those interests are aligned with the rest of the world when it comes to, to, to climate change. So I think that this, all this needs to be looked at. And um, one of the measures that I think uh, we, we need to, to think about as policymakers is um, to research this in, in, in um, clear depth, seeking truth from facts, um, not being influenced by propaganda. And I hope that the, one of the things that the government is doing is uh, either doing that research itself or commissioning it from unbiased sources. Um, because as a, as a, if you have the wrong view on it, and let's, let's be fair, I, I, I may have the wrong view on it. All I'm saying is government go out and make sure you have the correct view on it because it's crucial to, to the formation of, of policy. So very quickly, and I hope Steve, let me see how's the time going. I ought to move on um, briefly to, what should the government be doing um, if it, it may well be doing it, but is it doing it fast enough um, to, to come up with the sorts of policies and strategy? Um, and yeah, very obviously the first thing I think is get a strategy, have a set of policies, um, have them agreed and implemented across all government departments. Um, and because quite clearly um, China does affect just about every um, element of government and quite clearly we haven't been joined up in the past you only have to look at the flip-flops over the Huawei decision to know um, how badly United government was on that um, and the other point about a strategy is that um, while of course certain areas necess by necessity must remain, remain confidential 
most of it should be transparent so that not only government departments, but academia, business, uh, China itself knows where we're coming from and where we stand. Uh, it's also got to be kept up to date and it should be coordinated with all regions and localities. One of the big sort of strategies of the Chinese um, Communist Party is to bypass central governments. Um, and it's for that reason that Australia recently passed a foreign relations bill, which gives the central government um, the power to cancel agreements reached by local level governments and even, even um, publicly funded universities if they undermine national security. Uh, so um, we also need to think about how we coordinate um, policy, but not just at the sort of central um, Whitehall level, but what's happening in Scotland or Northern Ireland or, 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 or Cardiff or um, in Manchester or, or, or other cities. Um, I've talked about the need to understand the CCCP better. Um, what specific things should we, the government be doing? Well, first of all, uh, I think it needs to give long-term encouragement to the study of China. And that means at the school and university level, um, numbers of people studying Chinese Mandarin language are falling. There's an extremely good um, proposition being worked up, which so far the government has rebuffed uh, to, to make a Chinese civilization A-level on the lines of the classical civilization A-level. So you don't actually study Latin and Greek, but you study um, classical civilization. Well, our, our relations with the Romans and Greeks aren't nearly as important to us in the immediate term as those with the Chinese. We need a classical Chinese, uh, a, a Chinese civilization A-level as an entry for, for people young students to become interested in China and then go on from there to, to, to learn the language. It's the sort of thing that the government um, should be supporting those sorts of initiative. In understanding the, the CCP better, I think the government should be strengthening, it's, it's asking itself whether its links with think tanks and academia are sufficiently streamlined and strong. We have a lovely incident here where um, as one of two British officials who'd actually worked in the EU, um, I worked in the EU delegation in Beijing. Uh, I was rung up uh, a year or two ago. This was after I'd left um, by a friend of mine who said, Charlie, I've been asked at the cabinet office because they're doing a, um, some, a paper or something on EU-China strategy. Um, can you give me some tips as to what, what, what I might say? Because you've worked in the EU. And I said, well, the first thing you might say is, why not invite the two officials who've actually um, worked in the EU? Because I haven't been invited to this meeting and I'm one of the two of them. <laughs> so, um, you know, get, get your links sorted out uh, was, was the message from that, from that one. Um, but, you know, is there room for, for the secondment of, of, of more experts from academia uh, or, or, or think tanks or wherever from business? Um, and yes, I know there are problems with getting through the vetting process, which is extremely complicated, but put more money and priority into that because um, th this is an important area. Um, I've talked about the need for government to carry out and commission more research. Um, I'm, I hope, for instance, and I think they are working on questions like what are the essential supply lines and resources and goods wherein the UK must be independent from China because otherwise it gives far too great a hold over, over us. Uh, it's that sort of area. And finally, in this sort of um, getting better informed, is the government doing enough on open source intelligence work? Um, in other words, is the government Bellingcat competent? I suspect it isn't. I think there are some very rudimentary efforts going on. But if you look at how much these days can, can, can be um, learned by a sensible, a clever, in my view, I'm not a technologist, exploitation of open sources. I mean, the work, for instance, that Sheffield Hallam University has been doing on slave labor, um, in, in Xinjiang, extraordinary stuff, very useful. Or what Rusi, my own uh, organization uh, colleagues have done on, on North breaking of North Korean sanctions by, by China. Uh, you can establish an extraordinary amount. And I don't think the resources are being devoted by government to that. And if it doesn't want to set up its own or doesn't have the resources to set up its own unit in depth, well, buy it in. It's not that expensive to, to commission people to do it for you. Um, the third area of, of getting this policy right and et cetera is, uh, has the government 
got its existing structures better aligned to and systems better aligned to 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 reality. Um, in the past, I've argued with others uh, strongly that the, the the powers of the National Strategy Implementation Group, I think its name has been changed to the Integrated Review uh, Implementation Group, which sounds a bit like irrig irrigation. I don't know. It sounds awful, but whatever. Um, the, the point is that, uh, I mean, I, I was always struck by, by Kevin Rudd when he became prime minister of Australia, who uh, the, one of the earliest things he did was make sure that the, at cabinet level, there was a, a, a group that um, set China policy and, and ensured that it was uh, implemented. And I'm not sure that the NSIG is really sufficiently strong. It's certainly been strengthened, but uh, is, is it actually doing the business of, of coordinating government policy in, um, in, 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 in the depth and, and that it needs to be? I don't think it is. Um, and another area where, where, where I think work could be done is uh, on within Whitehall, the training and promotion of those with China experience. Um, and that's not just within the SCDO. If you look at Whitehall, there are very, very few it's hard to name any actually other outside the FCDO of DG level officials, director general level officials who've got any China experience. Um, I think there are three in the FCDO, maybe four. Um, three of them are currently ambassadors outside Whitehall. Uh, so, and again, a few years ago, it was quite, uh, it was, was the case that the sort of specialization that's required to become uh, as China competent as, as, as uh, necessary, was not being rewarded in promotion. If you were a specialist, um, you wouldn't you wouldn't get into the senior grades of the civil service. Um, that needs to change. Now, let, let's two other things I'd like to say in, in, in this before I come to it. In terms of um, measures that that need to go into this policy and strategy and which to some extent may be happening but I'm not convinced that they're happening at the, at the correct speed and depth um, and the first is um, the protection of UK science and technology research um, of course we have the 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 NSIA the National Security Investment Agreement um, and we also have a number of measures amongst which is, is, is the research collaboration advice team, which goes around the universities talking about the, the potential threats and, and, and protection of, of, of our um, valuable technology where it impinges on, on military or, or, or other forms of sensitivity. But I don't think either of those two mechanisms are um, really fit for purpose. Um, and indeed, uh, it, it's I mean, part, partly because the NSIA is, 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 a, is far too slow and it's a far too high a level and much of the um, important technology is coming, or right, new ideas are coming in very small startups which don't really meet the threshold and which are being hoovered up um, very early on in, in many cases. Um, and partly because there just isn't the teeth in the system where people go against the national security interest. So it's all very well that the research collaboration advice team goes around universities and says in gentlemanly fashion, I say chaps, I'm not sure it would be a good idea to work on this particular area, um, but these things are going on and they're going on big time and very worrying big time. And I trust that one or two of them will see the light of day in, 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 in the coming weeks because it really needs to, 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 to worry people. Um, so I think that what is needed is a form of perhaps a SAGE type, um, body, uh, as we have with COVID, of, of those that understand the technology that say, that give advice to government and say, look, uh, this sort of subject, no way should there be cooperation on that, or this sort of subject, yes, of course, that's fine, or this, this, well, it's a very grey area, in this case, we're going to come down against it, or in this case, we'll come down um, marginally, allowing it to go forward, but let's monitor, it. whatever, and the government would then make a decision uh, to say, and, and a quick one saying, no, this you do not um, cooperate because it has military uses or it has surveillance and oppression uses, which we, which we cannot accept. And that should be backed up with teeth. Those who go against that, and there are those out there doing it even now, um, 
should should be forfeit for it. And allied with that, I think, is um, beefing up the work that is going on with academia and, and others on, on the standards of, of conduct and the sorts of benefits that um, uh, recording of benefits, whether it's payment or benefits in kind or whatever, which are received from, from foreign powers or academia or others. Because this is a parallel, I think, with, with MPs' sleaze. It's academic sleaze. It's the selling of Britain's brains um, to harm the national interest, um, even, even though it's, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it, it's happening. And I think that uh, in this sort of new life in which we find ourselves um, where we do want to cooperate with China on science and technology in a way that we didn't with Russia for instance or the Soviet Union um, we have to set limits and, 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 and we have to put in systems which are um, which which people won't like um, you know MPs uh, I when I was advisor to the, the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee had to list every single uh, advantage pecuniary or otherwise that, that I gained to ensure that I had no interests. I think the same applies to academics, I'm afraid, particularly in the science and technology area. If you're being flown out to China, you'll be given an honorarium, you'll, you'll, you'll be given free flights and sometimes the holidays afterwards, uh, that needs to be recorded. If your laboratory is being funded by Huawei or whatever, that needs to be recorded openly and transparently. Another measure that I think is, is I'm, uh, Australians have set up a counter foreign interference coordinators office. I think we need to take the, the interference question a whole load more seriously than we do. Um, there is, in fact, in the security service, an organization called the Joint State Th Threat Assessment Team. Anyone heard of it? I doubt it. Um, it was set up in 2017. Uh, actually, it's very much aligned to the sort of threat that, that, that Russia brought uh, in Salisbury and that sort of thing. Um, but what it doesn't do, I don't think, is really properly address the threat of, of Chinese interference. And in that, addressing that threat, it's transparency and publicity, which are probably our greatest um, weapons of defence. And yet here we are with no with an organization that's set inside the security service, which no one has heard of, uh, and which is not that there on the ground with an executive body uh, taking action to counter what is unacceptable um, behavior. Another one, we should strengthen the advisory committee on business appointments. This is a, a committee, ACOBA, which um, is meant to ensure that politicians and top civil servants don't hire out right their past expertise within, the, within a few years of, of leaving their jobs um, in ways that are inappropriate, not least because in your last few years in a job, you, you might temper policy in a particular matter, thinking, well, if I'm too harsh on, let's say, Huawei, they won't give me a job when I leave, and it's very lucrative. Um, that really needs tightening up. Um, and, and so does the whole question of, of lobbying and the, the broader question of how the government is, is, is going to uh, or should or should it um, impose some form of restraint when it comes to the question of values and how people um, behave. There is increasingly a question of whether it is appropriate for UK people, particularly ex-civil ex servants and ministers, but not entirely, to, to work for companies which are helping, for instance, in either the slave labour or the crimes against humanity in Xinjiang. Huawei has three laboratories, joint laboratories with the People's, um, with, with, with the Public Security Bureau. Is it right for people to take jobs with them uh, and use their expertise to promote what they're doing there? I leave that with, with as, as a matter of debate. And finally, Steve, I know I've gone a little bit too long. Um, there are certain matters which I think won't wait and need to be done urgently. Um, I think that, in, 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 and some of that's going on already, but are we sufficiently coordinating with other free and open countries, um, particularly in Europe, but of course um, uh, elsewhere, Japan, India, Australia, the States. Uh, there's a whole range of, of, of matters there, particularly in terms of global governance, WTO level playing fields in terms of investment and, and trade with China. Uh, it's going on, that sort of, um, consultation and coordination, but I don't think it's going on nearly great enough. And finally, there's 
a Taiwan policy. This is a matter that I don't think will wait. Um, as we can debate whether China is likely to forcefully uh, unify with Taiwan in, in the next few years. I don't think it will, but it's not a risk that we should take. And I do think that we should have a policy where we say very clearly to China, there are 24 million people's lives here that cannot go um, um, against, uh, be forcefully unified, unified, unified against their wishes. And if you do, that will be sanctions and a break in diplomatic relations. That will cost enormously both us and you. Uh, this is a matter of geostrategy. Uh, if Taiwan is absorbed, then I think we could say that America uh, will lose the Western Pacific as an area of influence. Um, you can debate whether that's a good or a bad thing. It's also a matter of geo values. Are you prepared to allow, should you be allowed 24 million people to go against their wishes? Um, so, um, Steve, I've gone on a bit long there. Um, I think there's undoubted progress in, in from, from 2015, 2016, but I think there's a long way to go. There's a long way to go in terms of being clear um, for all of us. Um, and I think it needs far higher priority and urgency in, in, in the UK government agenda. Um, and I'm glad I'm no longer a civil servant because I think it's an extremely difficult problem. Well, thank you very much, Charlie. There's a lot of very important food for thoughts there. I wanted to push you some in on the, uh, what I thought was very in interesting part of your presentation. And then I'll come to the questions. We've already got about three or four, some of them compound questions um, in the chat, in the uh, Q&A box. What I wanted to push you is that you talk about the UK needs to strike a balance between our desire to maintain good relationship with China and also about uh, national security concerns. And then you use the word divergence. You said that is all about, that is mainly about divergence. In the rest of your talk, I think you really focus much more on the kind of serious challenges that China poses to us. Are you being a bit too diplomatic there in what you're saying? Are you talking about something much more than divergence that you're talking about, some serious competition of some form that we have with China, therefore that we need to deal with it much more seriously in the uh, last 20 minutes of, of so of your talk when you focus on what we should be doing. Yeah, I, I think that um, it would be very unwise, Steve, for, for any country um, in the face of these very different systems, not to have its uh, defenses in very good nick. One hopes that they would, as it were, never have to be to be used. But I, I don't think we should shy away from the fact that this is um, that potentially, if the current trajectory of the Chinese Communist Party continues, um, we are in um, uh, likely to, 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 to be in a very, uh, or we could be in, in, in a very um, confrontational and hostile world. That at least is a danger and it would be very unwise not to, 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 to prepare for that. Uh, no, I don't think anyone wants that. Um, and indeed, you know, we, we, we should um, do our best to, to minimize it, but you'd be very foolish not to, um, you know, try to understand what the Communist Party is saying and where it's going and raising your defenses accordingly. Okay, thank you. Let me uh, put some of the questions in the Q&A box to you. Um, we've already got quite a few there. The first one is from uh, Aram Ashraf. And the question is about uh, your report July report on empty threats, in which you mentioned that the BLI does not exist and that it is a slogan, a statement of aspiration. Could you expand a bit more on this here? What are your recommendations to the United Kingdom government cooperating in BLI related projects? such as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor? 
Well, I, I, I know I'm deliberately being a little bit um, uh, provocative when I say that BRA doesn't exist. Um, I, I, I think it's, um, in a sense, what I'm trying to do is, 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 is by another form of um, very small scale propaganda on my part, um, counteract what is a very good propaganda slogan on, on, on the Chinese part. Um, that um, because by use of that, that, that slogan, um, along with it comes a whole load of assumptions which are just wrong. Um, you know that this is the Chinese Marshall Plan. That that um, that that it's in 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 the interests of uh, uh, it's done purely in the interests of development and and and, and other people that, that you can benefit from it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, what I want to, to always say is it doesn't exist. But what does exist, and what's really important, is Chinese globalization. That that is going on and has been going on. Um, and rather than concentrate on the slogan, look at the um, actual manifestations of that globalization. Look at the individual projects that, that China is, is doing. Some, some of them um, beneficial, some of them may, may be not so, not so beneficial. Um, look at the fact that, um, again, you know, with, with Belt and Road, you, you concentrate, almost people concentrate almost entirely on, on, on infrastructure. Uh, that's what they assume. But look at the, the so-called plan that came out in, in um, March 2015. Um, it, there are five aspects to it. Uh, every, every bit is important in a sense as, as, as building roads. So um, whether, whether it's, it's um, standard setting, um, wh whether it's finance, um, you know, I mean, China now talks about a health belt and road or, or, or whatever. Uh, I think the point is, look at, look at the uh, search, you know, um, seek truth from facts rather than from slogans would, would, would be my, my answer to that. Now, um, and, and, and with that in mind, therefore, I would say that when the UK comes to cooperate with China in it, it, its globalization, I'm not using the words belt and road, but it's jolly difficult to avoid it, which is why it's such a good slogan. Um, we, we, we have to look at the individual projects and where we can add value. So that might be, for instance, in working with other countries, um, looking more closely and advising on some of the uh, environmental and labor safety standards, health and safety standards, health standards of, of, of some of the, the projects that, that are going on, or some of the develop, development needs. Um, it, it, it might be that, we can work closely with Chinese companies on providing um, expertise in, in the management of a project or, or, or whatever. Um, bearing in mind, of course, that largely where Chinese have done projects and given loans or whatever, they have almost used exclusively their own um, companies. But um, that just shouldn't stop us from, from trying to uh, work together. So, um, yeah. Look at look beneath beneath the slogan. Look at the reality and consider the individual cases where we can add value. Next question I pick comes from uh, Jessica, Kang, <coughs> who is a grad student at SOAS. What do you think the role of alliance formation is in the future of UK-China foreign relations? Do you think that the calls from some senior parliamentarians to call for an alliance of democracies to counter Beijing's influence could play into a new Cold War dynamics? Well, I think um, when, when I said at the end that the UK government must coordinate um, much more closely with like-minded countries, uh, I think that shows, shows my attitude. Um, whether you want to call it an alliance uh, or, or, or not, and uh, we have a lot of alliances already, uh, whether that's sort of NATO or, 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 or um, Five Eyes or, or whatever, um, I, I don't think really matters, but I do think the substance of it matters. And I do think that, yes, um, we should um, work much more closely. I mean, you know, one of the to me, deleterious things about Brexit is, is that along with it has come a, a sort of attitude that anything connected with the EU is to be avoided, but we have to work very closely 
with the EU on China. It's not easy because the EU itself is not very united. I worked in the EU um, and, and experienced that at, at first hand. But um, we must get together with um, the, certainly the bigger countries um, of it, the important ones, um, to try and um, strengthen ourselves by standing together. You're always more strong if you stand in um, with others. Uh, part of the um, Chinese strategy in many areas has always been to divide and rule. That in, in effect is, is, is a large part of the United Front strategy. Um, is that bringing us into a new Cold War? Um, well, of course, that's what we, should, we are already being accused of. It's an easy accusation to make. Uh, and one could make it the other way around. Just read half of the Chinese documents, any Chinese documents, uh, and, and, and um, it's quite clear that they do indeed have a Cold War mentality if you want to play that, that sort of name-blaming uh, name, name blaming game. Um, but uh, we, you know, as I say, I think that the, the systems are very, very different um, and, and we will have to take that into account. Cold War, not a Cold War because the Cold War, we didn't trade much with Russia, we didn't have science and technology interests with them, um, they weren't really important to us in terms of global goods like health or, or, or climate change, etc. Uh, all, all those things, very obviously, we have to work with, uh, with China on. But don't let, it, don't let our guard down. Next question I picked comes from somebody of, as a Hong Konger in the UK. Should the UK's policy on Taiwan be treated as a part of its policies towards China, or should it be aligned more with its democratic allies? Shouldn't Taiwan's experience and exposure be promoted among UK students and Whitehall officials, not only to promote diversity of views about the Chinese speaking world, but also to help them become a more aware of this important East Asian economy in the UK? Yes, good, good, good question. Um, and one with which I have um, tremendous sympathy. Um, I do think that um, certainly Whitehall officials were very much too much um, mainland centric and that's very important and increasingly important in fact, to, to understand what Taiwan is and where it's coming from. Uh, back in 1981, I started learning Chinese. I was sent by the Foreign Office to learn Chinese. I volunteered actually. Um, but, I, and, I, and in those days we learned in, um, came uh, London, SOAS, and in Hong Kong of all places, which wasn't great for Mandarin. And I said to the Foreign Office, let me go to Taiwan. Uh, and there was a big argument well, we can't let you go there because the mainland will, will, will uh, be upset about it. And eventually the ambassador, Sir Percy Craddock in, in, in Beijing said, no, let him go. Um, let's see what it's like, it's, it's a good idea. And it was a good idea because I think it gives you a very um, different perspective. And, and it requires you to understand much more about Taiwan as an entity, which is what I think lies behind this, this question. So yes, I think we should definitely understand um, much more about Chinese, we should have uh, Taiwan, we should have much more experience of it. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of, about that. Uh, we shouldn't be afraid of um, uh, being browbeaten by, by, by China on its, uh, by attacking us. Um, this is 24 million people. Increasingly, uh, the polls within Taiwan show where, where th what their thinking is. They don't wish to be unified with the mainland. Um, and so I, I think that um, I've called elsewhere for uh, a gradual reevaluation of our policy towards Taiwan and the opposite of what happens in the South China Sea where China does salami slicing. If you can have the opposite of sort of salami building, I'm not saying that we should suddenly change everything. And um, I think that would be too much to swallow, but just as China slowly carves away little bits of preconceived um, notions, so we too, when it comes to Taiwan, should um, gradually push the boundaries. Um, and we said, but, but as I said at the end of that talk, we must make it absolutely clear 
to, to China that if they do anything that is pushing, um, for, for it pushes unification forcefully, um, then we will have to sanction. And the, the states will, and I have no doubt that will follow. But we need to make that clear now. Right. Um, next questions come from Steve Tinton. You have talked about defense. What could be the focus of UK defense policy? Is it too traditional, based on physical assets, and not enough on how the UK can best defend itself against the threats you have outlined? Yes, I, as one would expect from SOAS, all these are very good questions. Um, and, and I do agree with the, the sentiment behind that. Um, it's not that we're, I hope, ever going to get into a firing war with China. Uh, and it's not really that the threat is, is, is so much in, uh, it's, it's, it's a much more of a, of a hybrid threat. So I, I'm no defense expert, but even when it comes to what would be regarded as traditional defense, uh, I have my doubts that aircraft carriers are um, the, the, the sort of effective um, form rather than the sort of thing that China is really putting its, its, its efforts into in terms of drones, um, underwater, uh, unmanned craft, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but beyond that, um, it's, I think it's absolutely right to, to, to point to the, as it were, the non-physical uh, assets. I think the UK is, is, is um, very well aware of the cyber threats. Um, and in terms of our defence, uh, I think our capabilities are probably um, one of the best in the world. Um, but again, linking to the Taiwan question earlier, um, I hope that we would do a lot more to work with Taiwan because Taiwan is at the front line of cyber attacks uh, and other forms of interference. So there's a lot of expertise there that we should tap into. Uh, and and um, I think behind Steve's question is, is something that I very much agree with, which is um, look at the nature of the threat look at the nature of interference when it becomes unacceptable um, and make sure that you've got the right form of defense uh, against it. And I, I mentioned JSTAT, uh, J, JSTAT, the Joint um, State Threat Assessment Team. <laughs> it's such an unwieldy um, acronym. Um, but see, if, you, uh, if you look at the very little that's come out about it, it really doesn't seem to be um, best drawn up to defend against the sorts of threats that the CCP might uh, use against us. So it needs to be. Okay. Next question from Jonathan Fanby, short, sharp. Can the UK have any influence on the PLC's policy towards Hong Kong? Well, I will, like you, Steve, I too would describe Jonathan Fenby as short and sharp. Um, but, <laughs> um, sorry, Jonathan, uh, for the personal remarks, I couldn't resist it. Um, not a great deal is, 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 is the answer, um, because uh, <laughs> it is physically part of, 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 of the mainland. What we can do, I think we've done uh, largely what we can do, which is uh, the BNO scheme, which I think probably um, came as a, something as a surprise to um, the main in China. Uh, and I think we should call it out, its behavior in terms of transgressing or disregarding an internationally agreed treaty lodged with, with, with the UN. Um, so beyond this sort of um, moral calling out, uh, and yes, um, sanctioning of people um, who are behaving, um, pushing forward the erosion of, of one country, two systems at a, at a frightening rate. It's very difficult to think of, of any specific other measures. If, if Steve or others have them, please um, shout about them because uh, if they're good, they should, they should pressure should be brought to bear on them. 
push them forward. Next question, so I picked, comes from Norman Stockman. He's referring to his time 15 years ago as secretary of the British Association for Chinese Studies, during which time Kerry Brown, our friend, mutual friend, had advocated that backs should lobby the government to make better use of the open source academic talent on China studies. You said the same this evening. What do you think is the main blockage in the governments that result in such slow progress in this area? Well, um, I think they're getting better, undoubtedly. Um, I mean, they're, they're, we, there are many more consultations than, than perhaps people realize and, and are not necessarily, people don't necessarily see them as uh, when they go on. Um, but I wouldn't be complacent about them. Um, I think a lot more needs to be got to be to be done, as I said during the talk. I mean, partly the blockages are um, people's time. Um, people in government are are extremely busy and have many the many demands on them. Partly the I think possibly the um, coordination between different departments is not all that it that it that it might be. Um, partly, as I said, it's um, certainly in terms perhaps of some of the longer term uh, co co cooperations or exchanges, there's this, this question of, 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 of vetting and whether you can actually get people in to work in government for, for a stage, which I think would be very, very, very useful. Um, but uh, of course, COVID, COVID hasn't, ha hasn't helped. But I think it's, it's also just a, um, a, a change in culture um, of, of getting out and about in government and having many more of these. Um, that's not really answering your question, Norman, but um, so I think, you know, as it were, we should all be keep keeping the pressure up, but let's not be too hard on, on, on my ex-colleagues in government. I think they're doing an awful lot more than they, the, than they used to. Okay, next question from great surgeons. Much of your analysis focus on making the UK less susceptible to the PLC's malign influence domestically. Can the UK or global Britain play a more active role in pushing back against Beijing's challenge to global norms or rules? In which area could the UK be more effective Well, um, I, th I don't think that the, the, the government, from, from what I see of it, is in um, any doubt about the importance of this, um, and indeed is, is putting um, a certain amount of effort into it, particularly in, say, um, a, a, a desire to, to update the WTO or uh, within the UN system, various uh, things there like the ITU, um, and, and 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 human rights areas, um, but it's uh, it's it's you know could we play a more active role? Well, you can always play a more active role. Um, these are very difficult areas, uh, changing changing things like uh, in the the WTO, which is probably the most important um, a, a, a area. Um, and Liz Trust has been, I think, quite quite vocal on the subject of um, the, the the need to change China's status, for instance, when it comes to China, um, from, from that of a developing country, uh, which it, it, it clearly is not in the same category anymore uh, as, as some of the, um, what used to be called the third, third world country. Um, so yes, of course, the UK can be, can, can be more active in that. Um, I think that requires, um, a, first of all, a better uh, understanding of, of the CCP, which is something I talked about earlier on in, in, in the paper, um, and, and a more focused uh, attempt to do it. But um, I don't want to sound complacent, um, but, but I think that it is, the government is aware of that and it is pushing it quite hard. Right. Um, next question comes from pity in a different dimension, and DC questioner would like to stay anonymous. What can be done about parliamentarians deploying a China strategy there that is 
growing anti-China. Sorry, what can be done about parliamentarians? Parliamentarians who are taking a position on China, which looks like and being anti-China. Well, um, for, first of all, uh, I think, as I said in, in, in my talk, differentiate between people who are being anti-China and people who are being anti the Chinese Communist Party. There's a big difference. Um, uh, and uh, the former, I think, being anti-China verges on racism and is to be attacked wherever it's, uh, it, it raises its head. Uh, I think it's perfectly legitimate for parliamentarians to have their views on, on the Chinese Communist Party and, and, and what its actions is doing. So I don't necessarily um, agree with the premise that something needs to be done about um, our parliamentarians querying the, the um, actions of the Chinese Communist Party um, in, in, in the UK. Um, I think the more discussion on that and the more noise that's made on that in, in a rational fashion, um, the better. Okay, uh, next question I pick comes from Philip Mead. Um, he talks about the UK's China approach towards China on a range of issues appears to be quite assertive such as shutting China out of some area of investments in sensitive technologies and sending warships to the Indo-Pacific, criticizing China on Xinjiang and Hong Kong, et cetera. The question then is, how might the Chinese government or the Communist Party interpret the UK, UK's assertiveness? And do you think the UK government is prepared for the blowback in the future, and in, if so, in what ways? Well, I don't think the Chinese Communist Party will at all appreciate any form of uh, what it perceives as um, resistance to its interests and policies. Um, I think that was something that I, I tried to make clear in, in, in the talk that I gave. And if you read my paper on, um, which I wrote again for the Council on Geostrategy, on what China wants and the, the UK, uh, that lays out a number of likely tactics that, that will come if we are, if and when we are seen to, to go against those interests, um, um, much of it um, huffing and puffing. Um, but am I expecting a blowback in the future? In a sense, I, I, I think that I'm slightly surprised we haven't seen more blowback uh, hitherto. Um, it's possible that um, by taking Australia as, as the whipping boy, uh, the Communist Party is uh, using that as a should yen, as an experimental zone and um, seeing the lessons from that, which it may then um, use and apply more broadly, including against us. But I sort of suspect that um, because we've come from the golden era and have yet to articulate a clear strategy or line, uh, until it's clear to the Communist Party that it's either overwhelmingly against their interests or maybe it's relatively within the line of their interests, then they are not going to um, make a decision to, to put us, say, in the doghouse if we're, if we're um, too much on the, wrong, on, on the wrong side. Because the, um, you know, the integrated review made it clear that a strategy is... Uh, not yet in place. In uh, theory, the government is due to provide a clear statement and strategy of policy in, in spring next year. Um, spring, of course, spring's a very elastic thing, so that, that could stretch um, so somewhat just as the integrated view was originally due and came out about six months after its due date, if not more. Um, so maybe once we've been more clear, uh, we will get a clearer reaction from China. But as I try to say in, in this talk, the bark is an awful lot worse than the bite. Right, next question I pick comes from um, Peter Humphrey. And Peter is talking about the British, some British universities have, uh, as a result of COVID-19, sending their students to learn to Mandarin to, to, to Taiwan instead of to mainland China. And the question is, do you think this should become a permanent practice 
under a more realistic UK-China relationship? Well, I'm not sure I connect it with the UK-China relationship, but I'm actually, from, purely from the point of view of language learning, uh, then I would advise people to go to Taiwan rather than the mainland um, for strange, some strange and some obvious reasons. I mean, I do think that in learning Chinese language, it's important to master the traditional characters as well as the simplified characters. Uh, learning your, your, your Mandarin based purely on simplified characters and then trying to branch into traditional characters is a very difficult way of going about it. Um, another reason for going to Taiwan is that it is just that much easier to mix with people um, and, and to, 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 to make friends and have uh, conversations and practice your Mandarin. And the third reason is it's very good to get a perspective from that side of the Taiwan Strait because um, the chances are that in learning um, the language and one hopes devoting a career um, to China in one form or another, you will end up in the mainland uh, for some time. At that point, it's useful to have seen what it's another Chinese based society is like, um, Taiwan. So, um, you know, th there, will, there will be reasons for going to, 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 to the main, and some of those have been weakened because um, you're talking about undergraduates, Peter, but I think if one were talking about graduates, um, the research one might do in, in the mainland has been somewhat curtailed of, of late, sadly, um, which slightly weakens the reason to go there. But, um, you know, China's a continent. There's every reason to go to China. Um, ideally, I would like to think that anyone who, who learns Chinese as an undergraduate would spend time in, in, in both places. Um, but, if, but if you're just talking about the language, maybe I'm biased because that's because I went to Taiwan when I learned my language, but I think it's a very good place to learn. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last question and this comes from Gray Scout. If you don't feel comfortable with it, that's all right, Charlie. The question is that Chinese students don't didn't begin to flood into UK institutions until the 2010s. How come a relatively wealthy UK with a long and strong educational tradition? would make itself so dependent on tuition fees from China so quickly? I, I, I mean, I'd love to answer the question um, and, and we'll try, but it's not, it's more one of competence and, than, than willingness. Um, I mean, the fact is that, you know, um, overseas students pay an awful lot more than uh, EU students did and uh, UK students did. So uh, there's, a, a willing source of money. When anyone offers you money, uh, you, you tend to take it. Uh, and I think it's, um, that's was unwise of, 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 of UK universities to take it in, in, in such quantities, um, or, or at least to, to, to have a dependency develop. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that I can be more enlightening than that. I, I, I'm sure Steve could be because you're you're in the in the business and in a, in a university. Um, but I would repeat that um, I think it's unwise for any business, and these days, sadly, academia can sometimes seem like a business, whether you're a supermarket or a university, to to be dependent upon one supplier. Well, th thank you, Charlie. I, I won't I won't give an, a long answer to that. One thing I will simply say is quite simply that. Um, until relatively recently, we're talking about a lot last few years, China did not have the image that China has today. And therefore, it's not so difficult to understand how British universities were feeling quite relaxed in accepting Chinese students previously. Now, Steve, uh, can I just add one thing there, though, that I, I think the obverse of that coin applies to, and that um, British universities should be not nearly as relaxed as they are about accepting some students and or um, monies for, for collaboration in certain very specific areas. Uh, and I'm referring there to, to, to areas that either have a military or a surveillance repression um, 
value. So I, when, when, when a university takes money to study, for instance, gate recognition, I, I find that morally wrong. I think we're dealing with two things, admitting students right. and uh, engaging in collaborative research in sensitive areas. I'm afraid we have run out of time and I do apologize to those of you who have asked very good questions that I have not been able to put to uh, Mr. Parton. Please be reassured that your questions will actually be sent to him after the event. And I would like to thank Mr. Parton for a very stimulating evening and for those of you who have taken part to ask very, very uh, sharp and interesting questions. And I hope to see some of you next week. Good night and goodbye.